This week, we welcome author, researcher, and activist on modern slavery, Siddharth Kara. You have asked the all-important question of our time, and I'm, I'm not overstating the matter. There are major government-driven mandates to transition from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles in order to meet important climate sustainability goals. But they're making these mandates. Nobody is stopping to think, what are the consequences downstream of these policies? Is there collateral damage to this? We're trying to save our environment by destroying the environment and the people in the heart of Africa. Right. You know, how is that okay? This is Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. If you like our work and want to support us, the best way to do that is join Phetasy.com. You'll get access to behind-the-scenes content, outtakes, discounts on merch, and the ability to submit questions for some of our upcoming guests. Support your favorite scrappy little internet heroes at Phetasy.com. Okay, I'm with Siddharth Kara, everybody. Welcome to Walk-Ins. Welcome. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. I'm really pleased to be here with you. Thank you for doing this. I saw your interview, like many people, on Rogan, and I was so glad he had you on because I feel like this topic gets brushed over, the topic of the cobalt mining, which is why you were on Rogan, to talk about your book, Cobalt Red. And... It's something, you know, you hear people make reference to. I'll see it a lot online as almost an insult, but I feel like no one has really dug into the topic like you did. Well, I, you know, it's it's an inconvenient reality um, that people, I understandably, don't necessarily want to engage with because... Uh, it means having to confront a, a very hard truth. And that truth is that um, people like you and I cannot function for 24 hours without participating in and contributing to enormous violence against the people and environment of the Congo. This has been the hardest thing for me, reading your book and listening to the podcast. And I want to open with the question that I end with on in my thinking on this is, what can we do? Because there is part of the reason that it's hard to confront is that there's a feeling of powerlessness and helplessness. And in order to embrace that cognitive dissonance, you have to just push it out. You have to. And there are things that people can do. Uh, obviously, you and I can't go to the Congo and solve the problem ourselves. Um, but um, the first thing we can do is flood the world with this truth. Because people don't know the truth through no fault of their own. They're going about their lives, uh, assuming that when they plug in their phone or um, tablet or car or whatever, they're making um, uh, living their lives in a reasonable way. Or in the case of an EV, making a, a green choice. So people don't know. And so we have to flood the world with truth. And that's the first step to any um, effort to address a horror. Uh, and that's how it's worked throughout history. Whenever there's been some hidden horror uh, truth seekers inevitably uncover it uh, and then bring it out into the world for, for the world to learn. Uh, and then you move on to the next phase. And that's where people like you and I can get involved. And that is um, when the world learns of a horror, there is inevitably a community of conscience that gets activated. Um, and I'm not smart enough to know what all the answers are, what levers need to be pulled and pushed and so on. Uh, uh, but uh, once that community of conscience gets engaged and in this case says, no way, not on my watch, not in my time, am I going to allow uh, the people living in the heart of Africa to be utterly destroyed uh, and degraded just to facilitate my rechargeable lifestyle? 
and, and then they will clamor for change. And there's there's a the policy side of me uh, has a whole long list of probably not terribly interesting policy maneuvers that need to be engaged. Uh, but a social movement is the next step once the world learns the truth. What are some of the policy levers? It's it's I'm interested to hear. So first and foremost, every company at the top of the cobalt supply chain. So every every mega cap tech and EV company makes the statement publicly that their supply chains for cobalt and other minerals, for that matter, are untainted by slavery, forced labor, child labor, uh, that mining is done sustainably and so on. So they make these statements publicly, even though the truth on the ground, at least vis-a-vis cobalt in the Congo, is utterly the opposite of those statements. So the first policy lever that needs to be pulled is the creation of an independent mechanism that will verify or or disabuse these statements that are made about what's happening at the bottom of a supply chain. That means teams on the ground, separate from the companies. You see, what's a company going to say other than, don't look here, everything's fine, right. no problems. And you think, oh, okay, very, ter- you know, jolly good. Let me go get my EV or let me get my, upgrade my phone. So independent <laughs> mechanisms on the ground actually... Uh, uh, verifying or disabusing those statements independent from the corporate sector. Now, another policy one that's important to think about. In this country, the U.S., there's actually a law on the books called the Trade Facilitation Act. People can look it up. It was passed in 2016. Uh, and it prohibits the import of any good made in part or in whole through forced labor or child labor. That law simply has to be applied to every gadget and car that has cobalt in the battery. And suddenly none of those things are available for import. And you'll probably get the attention of tech and EV companies very quickly. So that's a very powerful policy uh, maneuver that could be uh, brought to bear to ascribe some accountability to these companies. Why does that law get ignored? (laughs) (laughs) Money. (laughs) Money. Uh, You know, look, look who we're talking about. Yeah. These are these are companies worth trillions collectively. Yeah. I mean, who's not in their pocket mm-hmm. um, in D.C.? Um, and who's going to go up against them? Right. Uh, politically. Now, that said, there are and will be people of conscience, courageous political figures who will once this truth gets strong enough and is spread around the world enough and people like you and I are clamoring enough then it will become um, unacceptable to continue to ignore it. Um, and, and I think that's when we'll see uh, people in D.C. using uh, laws and policy to perhaps uh, uh, force these companies to accept responsibility for what's happening in the Congo. Uh, we can also make choices, you and I. Do we have to upgrade our gadgets every year? Yeah. You know, we don't have to do that. No, We've I been- usually wear mine into the ground. <laughs> Quite right. You know, but we've been marketed this idea that, oh, the phone has, you know, another the camera has another megapixel and the process. So we keep buying and buying. And that, of course, inf- inflates demand um, uh, for these products, all of which contain cobalt. So we can also make choices as consumers to say, you know what, I'm not going to keep contributing to this if I don't need to. So one of the things that I noticed listening and reading is that we don't even have mining companies on the ground in Africa, the United States. So how does that work? Does China mine the cobalt and then sell it to these companies? How exactly does that supply chain function? Yeah, it all goes through China. Yeah. You're right. And and this is something where we need to have courage as a country. Okay, because... Um, uh, and, and for that matter, courage as the West in articulating uh, in term articulating on the world stage uh, the kind of global economic order that should be prevailing. Is it the Chinese model that is to r- rummage, ransack and pillage uh, resources without necessarily being concerned about the human rights of people? or sustainable practices. You see, everybody at the top of the chain knows what's happening. Uh, And it's all, in this case, 
run by China. So Chinese mining companies dominate mining production uh, of cobalt in the Congo. Uh, the last time there was a U.S. mining company in the Congo was 2006. Wow. So, at, in fact, there was an American company that had uh, Freeport McMoran had the largest copper cobalt concession in the Congo. And they sold it in 2006 to a Chinese company at the dawn of the cobalt revolution. And, and, and with that, China very methodically and frankly, quite shrewdly, cornered the global cobalt market before anyone knew what was going on. Now the U.S. and the West are playing catch up because all the cobalt is scrounged out of the ground by Chinese companies. Uh, it flows through China for processing and then gets sold to the battery manufacturers, again, most of which are in China. Uh, and they send, sell the batteries to smartphone makers and tablet makers and, of course, EV manufacturers. So... Is this a way that some of these people and companies at the top of the supply chain wash their hands of it a little bit is saying, oh, it's not our mining companies. We're in a, you know, we are told that this is clean, clean. What do they call it? There's no such thing as, as clean cobalt, not from the Congo anyway. Uh, and let's be clear, roughly three fourths of the world's supply of cobalt is mined in the Congo. Wow. So, you know, there's not enough other cobalt out there to say my cobalt is clean, it, it's, right. especially since it's all funneled through the same processing facilities in China. So, right. but to your point, yes, there's this there's this kind of pathetic little game that's played uh, of companies at the top of the chain saying, well, you know, we're buying it from uh, this mining company uh, and they tell us everything's OK, so it must be OK. Uh, and of course, they know. None of that is true. There's been enough coverage of what's happening on the ground in the Congo that they know it's not true. But they point their finger downstream uh, to the mining company. Right. The mining company continues. They point their finger downstream. And everyone's pointing their finger downstream and saying that person's responsible, that person's responsible, until the last finger is pointed at a child in the Congo caked in toxic grit and filth. And cobalt is toxic. Okay, it's toxic to touch. It's toxic to breathe. Uh, and so the last finger is pointed at that child earning a dollar a day, being polluted and, and poisoned every day and suffering uh, horrific injuries eventually uh, uh, just to earn a dollar. And so no one is accepting responsibility. And, and that's the cruelty of all this, that these enormous fortunes are being made on the backs of people who are dying every day for our cobalt and no one even acknowledges them. That was something that really struck me was that in the course of history, this is maybe the most wealth that's ever been created on slavery. Yes. <laughs> it hurts. You know, to to think about that. Yeah, that one. I I keep th it. It makes me emotional. You know, I it, we think it's gone. That that's the cruelty of this. You see, we're here in the year twenty twenty three. Slavery has been rejected by human civilization for more than one and a half centuries. There are any number of international instruments proclaiming the equality of all people, the universality of dignity and human rights. And yet we live in a time when vis-a-vis -vis the cobalt supply chain, never in the history of slavery or colonial pillage has there been more human degradation that generated more profit at the top of the chain and touch the lives of more people around the world. Never in history. And, and that's happening today in this era. And the fact that this is happening on our watch in our time, uh, I think it should it should be. It, it's enormously painful uh, for people like me who work on human rights, and I think it should be and probably will be enormously painful um, for anyone with a conscience, with a heart and with a sense of decency uh, uh, and dignity. Yeah, and it's happening globally. You know, this is not something that's just in the United States. It's it's all over the whole world is partaking in this. And 
it does seem again when I face this, I've I've started signing off my emails um sent from my blood phone, you know, how it's like sent from my iPhone. Right. Because I, I don't know how to I again am confronted with just not knowing how to take all of this information in and I'm sitting here talking looking at three screens, you know, and, and I know that this is I'm part by just partaking in society, I am a part of this horrific slavery. It feels yeah. horrible and also demoralizing and, def you know, it feels like, well, what, what can I do <laughs> other than this? What can I do? Well, this to, is important. Yeah, th th this is, this is important. You know, it, throughout history, horror and atrocity thrives in the shadows. And this is bringing light into that heart of darkness in the heart of Africa. Um, and it's, it's alerting people that we have all been made fools of. We have all been made unwitting participants in an enormous violence and an enormous invasion of the human rights of the people in the heart of Africa. None, none of us would choose this. None of us would say, I really need to ensure that people in Africa are suffering so that I can plug in my phone or my car or my laptop. N none of us would ever make that choice, but it's been forced on us by companies that make more money than you can ever calculate. And yet, have decided that a mild or modest amount of attention and expenditure to ensure safety and dignity for their employees in the Congo digging out their cobalt is not worth it. They're not worth it and, and their how, environment. But how does Apple, for instance, let's just use them as an example. How do they, how do they enforce that if they're, it's not even their company doing the mining or it's not Get even an ground. American? Get on the ground. Mm. Get on the ground. You see, demand for cobalt starts at the top of the chain. Everything that's happening downstream is a consequence of that demand. The blood for cobalt supply chain would not exist but for the enormous demand for cobalt that is created at the top of the chain by tech and EV companies. Full stop. So everything else is a consequence. All the bad actors, be it a Chinese mining company or a crazy soldier with a Kalashnikov, they're all a consequence of that demand for cobalt at the, at, at the top of the chain. And yet, has any employee of Apple, let alone its CEO, stepped foot in the Congo to see, hold on, let me just take a, let me take a look, see of where my cobalt's coming from? Have they even been there? Mm -hmm. To the ground, to see for themselves. No, no, they don't because they just say, well, someone else's, it's someone else's responsibility. Well, they created the demand. They created this chain of atrocities. And I think they're obliged to have a team on the ground at all times looking, observing, enforcing basic human rights, basic practices, because let's not forget, they already say they do that. Right. They already say they do that. They already say their supply chain. If you see the language, it's it, and it changes year to year. They all have statements, but Apple's is something like, we ensure that the millions of participants in our supply chain around the, around the world, uh, uh, that their human rights and basic dignity is observed and maintained and so on. So they're already saying it and yet not doing it. And that's the problem. Right. What inspired you to go investigate this? Well, I have been traveling the world doing research on slavery and child labor uh, since the summer of 2000. Um, I left my career in finance and just felt I there was a, di a different reason that I was on this planet other than padding my bank account. Um, and it, I wasn't sure what it was, but I knew it was going to be in the area of human rights and in particular contemporary forms of slavery, that I would find some way to make a contribution. Um, around 2015 or 2016, I I started hearing from some colleagues in the in the in the anti-slavery space. Uh, Siddharth, um, 
if you heard about the situation with cobalt uh, in the Congo, it's in the batteries and the, and the conditions are very bad. And I had no idea. I thought cobalt was a color. I thought it was on, <laughs> you know, Ming vases and, and uh, you know, and Monet paintings and so on. I, I had no idea that it was actually a, a something in the periodic table uh -huh. that was used in tech. And I so I started to poke around at this. And, and sure enough, something bad was happening. I didn't know what, but something bad was happening. In fact, the world really didn't know what. Uh, and it took me a couple of years to organize my first trip, you know, to establish ground relationships and, and a plan and uh, of how to go about conducting research in a pretty dangerous part of the world, uh, a pretty lawless part of the world. Anyway, long story short, I got there on the ground in 2018 and I thought I knew what I was going to see. And, and you have to remember, now I'm 18 years into a journey of of probably going to 50 different countries documenting slavery and child labor. Wow. I mean, in some of the worst, I mean, Nigeria, Albania, Moldova, uh, Bangladesh, I mean, dozens in the worst of the worst, right? And so I thought I was ready. I thought I was prepared. And what I saw when I got there was a hellscape beyond anything I could have ever imagined. And it was like passing through some sort of portal, time portal, and the, the 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 moral clock had been dialed back two centuries wow. to colonial times. And you could look in one direction or another and not be sure what century it was because of the way people were living and working. And, and, and the, the whole thing just was a, like a thunderclap that just that just whacked me uh, in the head and, and was beyond anything I could have imagined. So clearly this is the worst conditions you've seen in your 20 years of doing this now. Can you imagine that? No. The, the, the worst, the worst and manifestation of modern day slavery is at the bottom of the richest supply chains in the world. And what makes it the worst uh, uh, compared to the other places that you've seen? What were the other, when you were talking about all of the other countries, Bangladesh and Moldova and some of the other places you'd visited, what were they, what were they doing? Well, you know, uh, when you're talking about modern day slavery, worst is, is just a relative of worse to, to worse than worse to worse than that. Right. right. It, it's, it's not like anything is even remotely palatable or acceptable. It's all gut wrenching mm -hmm. in Thailand, for instance. And I, I've done three full research trips to Thailand over the years. Um, one of which was into in the seafood sector. Um, Thailand is the second largest exporter of shrimp in the world. Most of it comes to the U.S. and the EU. And what happens is um, uh, men from around the Mekong subregion, Cambodia, Lao, Thailand, um, uh, Myanmar, are trafficked into the, to the seaports and they're, they're just sold off to ship captains. You know, they, wow. they think they're coming to, to, to work. And they're just auctioned off for six, seven, eight hundred dollars to ship captains who take them out to sea where they have to catch trash fish, skipjack tuna uh, 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 and other seafood that's out in, in sea. And they're, of course, being out in a boat. There, there's no way to monitor what's done. So uh, the, the people I documented and I talked with would speak about being tortured, electric shock. They saw people who were just shot and thrown overboard and they're never paid or paid almost nothing. Uh, and that's the kind of horror that that's at the bottom of a lot of seafood supply chains that gets brought to the West. Place like Nigeria, you have this barbaric sex trafficking phenomenon of young girls who undertake these almost voodoo oaths uh, and, and are trafficked into Western Europe and forced into prostitution with debts of that they're supposed to repay of 40,000 plus euros. Uh, which means being raped 10 times a day, 360 days a year for five, six, seven years. Now, that's about as horrific as, as anything you could imagine mm -hmm. uh, on an individual level. You, know, you can't imagine m much worse of a fate happening to any one individual. Um, it's pretty bleak. And you, you go down the list that the underbelly of a lot of the global economy is characterized by this barbaric exploitation of the most vulnerable and impoverished people in the world. The reason I say what's happening in the Congo in, in, in aggregate is worse than all of it is because 
you have an entire population of people. There are millions of people who are living there. An entire population of people who are being poisoned every day. Mining companies dump out all this toxic effluence into the dirt, the air, the water. They're supposed to be doing it sustainably. Okay. It's not happening. So everyone, you, you, you may live there and have nothing to do with cobalt mining, but every day they're being poisoned. So there's a rash of cancers, birth defects, neurological diseases, respiratory ailments, on down the list. The animal stock has been contaminated. Fish stocks have been contaminated. Millions of trees have been clear cut to make, to make room for these giant, enormous open pit mines. So arable land is gone. So, so people can't even grow food to eat. Now, la- layer on top of that, the people who do dig for cobalt, and there are hundreds of thousands of them. There are thousands of young women with babies on their back. Those babies are being poisoned every day. No, no one will ever know what the toll on their lives is. Every day, hundreds of people are being injured, crushed legs, uh, broken spines. Uh, shattered bones. Uh, Every day, people are being buried alive in tunnel collapses. So wives are losing husbands, parents are losing children. Every day, young girls, instead of being in school, uh, uh, are rinsing toxic cobalt stones in water to fill up a sack. It's just in the aggregate, there is so much harm, Mm -hmm. injury, and destruction taking place generating so much money and touching our lives that there's just nothing in my mind, nothing worse. Mm -hmm. I I don't know what inspired you to go on this path in 2000. It's, it's like a fascinating kind of shift in the middle of being in finance of all things. Was there kind of an aha moment or did something happen or did you have a, a dream that you woke up from? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't a dream. It was, I, I woke up. I woke up. Uh, that's for sure. Um, uh, but there, it, it, there, there is a, there's a story, uh, you know, there's an arc there. My life is kind of this sequence of winding uh, journeys that have somehow made sense uh, in the longer arc uh, of my life. Um, when I was a, a college student, um, uh, I went to Duke University uh, in the early 90s. I was a college student. And at that time, uh, the former Yugoslavia was falling apart. Um, uh, just an eruption of violence. And I can remember um, sitting in my dorm room, fretting about a term paper. As I was a very good student. I really studied hard. I wanted to get the best grades I possibly could. And so I was just fretting away about this term paper. And the news was on in the background. And I saw this story about the latest explosion of violence, children being killed, legs shattered by shrapnel and so on. And I just thought, wow, I mean, I could have been born over there and, and just through no fault of my own, be, have my life completely destroyed by this mindless violence. And here I am at a prestigious university with such a uh, sheltered life and, and fortunate life. And I'm, I'm all agitated about my paper. (laughs) <laughs> I thought I, I have to do something. You know, I just felt I had to do something. So I put together a project with a couple of other students to volunteer in a Bosnian refugee camp that next summer. And so I did. I spent the summer in the Bosnian refugee camp. I went there. I had all these ideas of what I was going to do. I was really going to change things. Okay. I was, I was 19 at the time. This is the summer of 94. And I got there. I got to this refugee camp. And I immediately realized I was completely in over my head. <laughs> I, I, there was nothing I could do. Yeah. Nothing. I didn't even understand what was happening. Yeah. Let alone be equipped to do anything meaningful. Uh, except one thing. And that was listen. There were people there crying out with enormous pain and agony. And no one was listening. And then there was this random college kid from America who showed up and said, okay, I'll listen. And I heard all these horrible stories of genocide, atrocities, and soldier uh, so, s- stories from the women and older women. So there's only a bracket, right? There, was, there were no young men there. They were either fighting or they had been killed. 
Mm-hmm. And there were older women and very young girls, like, you know, 50 and up and then 10 and younger. Mm-hmm. And they would tell stories of the Serbian soldiers who had co- come to Bosnian villages, kill, kill the men and take the young women and teenage girls and take them to rape camps and brothels and sell them off and traffic them. I I'd, I'd never heard of anything like that. <sighs> And, and I didn't know even how to process it. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I came back. I graduated. Um, my plan was to actually go to grad school and get a PhD in English. I had majored in English uh, and be a professor. And I thought, really, is that is that what I'm supposed to do? Um, maybe there's something else in the world. Uh, where does one explore the world? I thought, oh, New York City. Where, where else does one go to explore the world? So I went to New York, just threw my stuff in my car, drove to New York, uh, stayed on the like a friend's cousin's uncle's third, you know, third re- degree removed person's sofa. Mm-hmm. Uh, while I was in New York, I got into finance, as people in New York sometimes do. Yeah. <laughs> and then then it was like a few years down the road. I thought, now, what what is my life going to be about? And that refugee camp experience had always stuck with me. And always kind of was haunting me in the back of my head. And I started to look in the late 90s. Are these things still happening? And if so, is anyone doing anything about it? And I didn't really see much other than the odd report about human trafficking and so on. Nothing about why and what do you do about it? And in my heart, I knew these were economic crimes. It wasn't cruelty for the sake of it. People were making money by exploiting other human beings. That's the logic of slavery from the beginning. So I thought maybe I'll make a contribution. All right. I put everything in storage and then just jumped out into the world without much of a plan. But I figured at least let me try and I'll always be able to tell myself I tried, I failed, but at least I tried. And of course it went the other way because after that first trip, I thought this is, there's something here that I need to devote my life to. So you kind of fell into journalism. Yeah, because what I, what I learned from the refugee camp is, it was the lesson I took with me as I started going around the world trying to do human rights research, which was to listen. Right. And if I did nothing else, I would just listen. And when you listen, you hear people's stories and you hear their truth and you hear the truth of a people in a place, uh, a phenomenon, a region, uh, 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 an atrocity, whatever it is. Um, if you just take time to be in a place and listen. And so I just would take notes and write what I heard, the testimonies, the voices um, uh, of all these various faces and, and, and facets of, of child labor and slavery and trafficking for forced prostitution and trafficking for other uh, uh, kinds of exploitation. And it started to sort of piece together in my head. Um, and then I started writing. It reminds me what you're saying about how you landed in Bosnia and had no idea what to do. We took our honeymoon in South Africa, but we had the we were going with an organization that's working to fight back against the rhino poaching. And so because we were with that organization, we had access to all kinds of people on the in these rhino wars And you go in with this idea and it was shattered by every conversation that I had with a different person. There was a different perspective. So, for instance, the guy who was the head of the park had this idea of kind of the noble poacher and, oh, they're just trying to feed their family. But then you talk to the locals and they're like, no, they're just pieces of shit who want to do drugs and party. And every single person that we talk to, and of course, it all goes back to China. <laughs> I'm like, it's always China somewhere in the background of these things lurking. And the incentives, you know, on the ground, I, you see the poverty and you see the desperation and what other opportunity or option do some at least that's how it's justified. You know, what other option do they have to make money if not poaching rhinos for, for in this example? And that's an argument I've seen a lot of people making, even just in the comments for your book, like, well, what do you expect these people to do? They're lucky they have the dollar a day. Um, I don't know that it's better than nothing. It's, you know, there's so many um, important, points you've you've made in that anecdote um 
uh, the first one is, you know, the ground truth is always something different than you'd imagine. Mm. You go in with these ideas. They could be very well-informed ideas, you know, very well-educated ideas. Um, and, and so you have these preconceptions of what you're going to see and what and, and what the reason behind some phenomenon is. And then you get on the ground and realize when you stop and listen to the people there, um, you often have it completely wrong. Or, or there's a lot of different reasons why something's happening. And, and nothing drives me more crazy than, you know, going to some convening at a UN agency in New York or Geneva, and everyone's talking about solutions for people that they've never even met. Right. You know, they've never even gone to the place, but they think, you know, they've got this, these ideas of, you know, what helps people emerge from poverty, what mm-hmm. helps people climb up the development ladder. And it, it may be completely inapplicable. Right. To to what's happening on the ground. I'll give you an example. I, I remember I was doing research in northern India. Uh, I've done a lot of research in India over the years. I'm doing research in northern India in a village and a very, very poor area. And the World Bank had been in there and they had dug a dam and they had done some built a uh, some s- stronger huts that could withstand the monsoons and given some microcredit loans to local communities and so on. All these things that are like anti-poverty development things that, you know, academically make sense. And they're all good. And I remember talking with some of the people uh, in the village, especially in women, and they'll tend to talk separately from the men to just be a little more comfortable. And I said, you know, all these things that were done, um, were they helpful? Is there something else that would have been more helpful? And they all, they all sat down. They said, if they had actually just asked us what we wanted, we would have said one thing, a toilet. Right. Because we have to go out into the field every morning and do our business. And the men look at us and it's so degrading. And sometimes we're attacked and we just want a toilet with four walls where we can lock the door and feel safe Mm -hmm. and private. And and that's the example of what you're talking about. There's these ideas of what people need. Uh, And then there's the reality of what if you actually go on the ground and talk to people and so when people say, hey, look, yeah, that looks miserable, but a dollar is worse, b- better than zero. So what's the problem here? Right. And I can't tell you the number of slave owners and slave exploiters who use this line of reasoning with me. They'd say, well, you know, if yeah, OK, maybe they're only making 50 cents in debt bondage on my farm or or, you know, this young girl is being raped. So they won't use the word 15 times a day. The alternative is she probably starved to death or, you know, the alternative is something worse. And and so the response is just because in this moment, the alternative to being exploited like a slave might be a little worse in that that person might starve within a few days doesn't mean exploiting them like a slave is okay. Right. (laughs) Yeah. It, It means the entire society, the entire economy, the entire everything has failed that person. Right. No parent I ever met wanted to take their children to work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They want them in school. They want them to learn. And so from the outside, people say, well, you know, they take the kid, the kid can work and they'll earn and that's better for the family. OK, maybe on that day it is because the kid will earn another dollar and they can eat a little more. That doesn't mean it's okay for the kid to be working and not in school. It means some structural failure has taken place that's put a parent in that position to make that choice, to make that non-choice. So, yeah, a dollar a day is better than zero, but that doesn't mean being paid a dollar to be toxically, uh, to be exposed to toxic cobalt and maybe suffer a shattered bone within 30 days. That's not okay. Right. It is interesting how you hear all these stories about just the the outside organizations coming in trying to help and usually or often making things worse. Or you'll hear about aid that will sit on runways because there's no infrastructure. So it can't even get to the people or the warlords in that community are taking it or In this instance, when this organization, they went in thinking, you know, we're going to help train these guys, the the rangers, and they got there and they were like, we need boots. (laughs) 
Like, <laughs> yeah, we just right. don't have boots. That's yeah. what we need more than anything. We need more than any like training that you can offer us. First, we need boots. And so they yeah. did a big, you know, drive to try and get some boots for all of these rangers because they were walking around in all of this brush. And, you know, you, I don't know, you've, you're probably familiar in Africa with those like barb, the, yeah, it's, oh, yeah. they were in sneakers and, and shoes that just couldn't handle it. So yeah, they, they, we have these big ideals that I think come from our position and then you get down there and realize it's like you said a toilet that they need or shoes or something even more basic that we take for granted yeah that that's exactly right and the other consequence of that you know this disconnect between aid agencies or ngos or you know these academic white paper informed policy uh, convenings the, the other consequence of that is that people get jaded you know right. they they think you know, what's the point of me giving a hundred dollars to so and such a uh, big, you know, international NGO or aid agency? Because, uh, like you said, the money's just going to sit on some tarmac somewhere, the food grain is not going to get to where it's supposed to, or it's going to get there's graft along the way. And so people get jaded. And uh, that's why it's so important to have direct links into grassroots organizations, you know, like you did when you were in South Africa, that you, when you had those links to the people on the ground and the, uh, the, the grassroots interface, you got what the truth is, yeah. what was, what was really needed. And not everyone can go there themselves, but uh, when you have journeys like the one you took or, or the ones I've taken, you know, or other journalists, um, uh, that's, that's what forms the connective tissue between People who have to, of course, work and live their life and can't just get up and jet off to um, the dangerous corners of the world. Uh, it, it forms that connective tissue for them. And you can help bring out from where you were. No, no, stop. They need boots. Right. You know, and these kind of boots uh, or stop. They just need toilets, four walls and a door. They don't want a dam. They don't want any of that <laughs> stuff. They just want to go to the bathroom safely. Mm -hmm. And with their dignity preserved. And if you go down to the ground in the Congo, I mean, there's all these people talking about what the Congolese people need. And they've never stepped foot there. Or they, you know, they fly in to the wrong part of the country, stay at a hotel and leave. You'll see, you know, they need some schools to be built. Workers need a fixed wage, not this piece rate business where they earn a dollar or two a day. They need a fixed wage of 10 or $15 a day. Then they can keep their kids in school and don't have to drag them into the pit. They need basic PPE so they're not being poisoned every day. Mm -hmm. Some gloves, some masks, because it's, goggles. It's just like it's hand, by hand, correct? It's by, yeah, by hand with little pickaxes or stretches of rebar or whatever they can scrounge up, sticks and so on. It's all bare hand exposed skin exposed lungs you know so it's it, the simple thing of just giving people masks and gloves would reduce a lot of harm and no one's on the ground even seeing that and realizing that let alone trying to get masks and gloves to people uh, little things go they have such huge dividends if they're the right little things you know, and then all these big ideas. I talk about one in my book, you know, a couple in my book where there are these these big things where a mining company says, OK, we're going to build a wall and then no one will get in and get hurt. And so they build like a six foot wall and everyone just climbs over it. <laughs> and now you have to climb over a wall. <laughs> you know, it, it, so, but outside the Congo, the optics are, hey, everything's secure. We built a wall. Oh, and it's electrified. OK, they'll say it's electrified, which it's not. Uh, but as a consequence, no one's getting in the mine and people just climb over the wall. And the, you know what the thing is? They know they're going to climb over the wall. They want them to climb over the wall because they want that added penny wage production because they can't get the cobalt out of the ground quickly enough. So the wall is just PR. So it, it's a it, it's it's always about these fictions told outside of a place and then the reality on the ground and truth seekers have to get that truth out into the world. It I don't know how you sleep at night a and b are not completely jaded. Do you does this inform your view of capitalism? You know, is this just 
is is this the product of capitalism? Is there any other system where you avoid this? What is your view on on our supply chains? Capitalism requires boundaries. Okay, if it's left to its own devices, if it's left unmonitored and unregulated, then this is the consequence. The destruction of poor people, their environment, the pillage of their resources, the exploitation of their labor to boost profits at the top of the chain. And and that's been true for centuries. I mean, the original slave trade was a capitalist economy. Right. I mean, unbounded by any moral considerations for the value of an African life. It, It was pure economics. Every step of the chain was about boosting profits. When the ship captains left Western Europe to get to West Africa, the seasonality of it, what happens to the seas from one time of year to another, that means how much time you have to spend at sea, which means how much you have to pay the ship hands. And so there were all, it was economic considerations, how long the crossing would took, whether you landed in the season of harvest or not. So that meant the slaves had a different, so all these calculations about maximizing the complete return on investment of the triangular trade, which was right. Europe to Africa, to the colonies, and back. That was capitalism, unbounded Mm -hmm. by any moral considerations, Mm -hmm. pure economics. Now, we're supposed to live in an era now with a super globalized economy. It doesn't take you weeks to go from point A to point B. You know, it can happen like that. Uh, We live in the era of a super globalized economy, but it's supposed to be bounded by these conventions on... Um, the sanctity of human rights, the preservation of all people's dignity, uh, uh, that their trees are the same as our trees, their water is worth the same as our water, and their lives are worth the same as ours. Now, left to self-regulate, capitalism Fs it all up. Right. It dials it back to that colonial slave trade capitalism. So it there, there has to be a a force of moral authority imposed on capitalism, whether it's regulatory or citizen driven, the, it, it requires boundaries imposed on it so that it can't run amok on the poor subclass of humanity as it has done for centuries. And so I inherently capitalism can be a force for good in the world economically, but it has to have checks. It has to be bounded And that's where we're failing, particularly the people uh, across the global south. You know, are there instances of this? I think of Nike and how there was this big push to every it suddenly burst into the consciousness. Nike had sweatshops. And did they make changes or was it all bullshit? Yeah, social change. You know, the struggle is to make it stick. Uh what happens is sometimes the world gets flooded with some truth of a horror in the case of this one sweatshops for your sneakers. Um, And everyone gets rightfully hot and bothered. That's the community of conscience. I talked about, wait a minute. I don't want to go play hoops in shoes that were made by kids working 16 hours a day and making 50 cents. Uh, And so there'll be a period of time where there's a lot of attention and it runs very hot. And then uh, companies promise change. And when that change is uh, reliably uh, audited and consistently audited by a third party outside of the chain, right? It has to be outside the chain. Capitalism can't self-regulate. Then that change can stick. And so there has been enduring improvements Uh, In the case of the bottom of the sneaker supply chain, I'm sure there are still kids somewhere working 16 hours a day for a dollar making somebody's sneakers. Uh, And I know for a fact, because I've done this research, that there are young girls working all day and not going to school, sewing buttons on our shirts and so on. Right. right? I mean, the apparel sector is has a longstanding problem. Right. Child labor and labor exploitation in South Asia and Southeast Asia. The NGO sector and journalists and activists have to keep at it, keep pushing, because otherwise there's this backslide. You know, after attention is run hot 
and there's been some change made, there's this backslide to business as usual. And so what I'm concerned with as the world learns about this truth is that it's not the same model, right? That companies at the top of the chain don't promise, okay, we're going to do this, this, and this, and it all looks good for a period of time. And then there's this backslide that that's right. what has to be avoided. I mean, blood diamonds is another example where a very horrific truth came out. Yeah. You, you see this pattern again and again, the world was flooded with this truth that wait, what? I mean, you had big Hollywood movies about it. Right. Right. Um, everybody knew everybody everywhere knew about blood diamonds. And so there was an entire UN driven protocol called the Kimberly process that was put in place to make sure that diamonds are not, uh, you know, mined by uh, peasants under coercion, the militias fueling violence and so on and so forth. And it's a mixed result, but it was a step forward. Uh, so that's, that's, that's sort of the model that has to be achieved, which is flood the world with truth community of conscience is outraged, agitates and clamors for change. And then it's up to journalists, NGO workers and people to keep the pressure on. So there's not a backslide to business as usual. Yeah. What's crazy to me about this is that it's the electric vehicles that have the most need for cobalt. That's the, the highest percentage goes to these batteries because they're huge, obviously. So what is the percentage? And it's it's something that's being pushed by governments everywhere. So why wouldn't they simultaneously be making sure that these people have a dignified life if you're essentially promoting this and trying to incentivize people to switch over to EVs? You it's not just asked- companies. It's p- politicians. You have asked the all important question of our time. And I'm I'm not overstating the matter because you're exactly right. There are major government driven mandates to transition from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles in order to meet important climate sustainability goals. You know, the goals are important. There's nothing wrong with the goals. Paris Accords and COP26 and 27 and so on, the goals of making sure that our children inherit a, a, a clean, sustainable planet, that's a good, important goal. And uh, reducing fossil fuels is a part of that goal. Now, internal combustion engines are responsible for about one-fourth of uh, uh, carbon emissions. So you say, all right, Let's make everybody drive an EV. Okay, fine. But they're making these mandates. I mean, in many cases, there's a couple of dozen countries that have said no more internal combustion engine sales by 2030 or 2035. I mean, that's I think just, we have that in California, it, don't we? Pro- we? We may very well have that in California. Yeah. Uh, it's just that that's right around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's not like 2080 or something. This is right around the corner. Uh But nobody, to your question, and I mean it, it's the important question of our time, nobody is stopping to think, what are the consequences downstream of these policies? And the consequences in the case of the EV batteries, they require an enormous amount of cobalt, up to 20 pounds of refined cobalt. Wow. That's two bowling balls worth of cobalt. Um, per car. And now you multiply that by tens of millions, up to hundreds of millions of cars that would be sold in the next couple of decades. Do the math. Okay. So has anyone at the, at the top of these government policy circles that are putting out these mandates thought, what's the consequences downstream? What's, is there collateral damage to this? And and this is the problem. This is why it's such an important question. We're trying to save our environment by destroying the environment and the people in the heart of Africa. Right. You know, how is that okay? Right. How is it okay for us to pursue sustainability? It's the same planet. They're not living on a different planet. <laughs> right. <laughs> we're, we're all 
theoretically on the same planet. Although if you go to the Congo, you wonder sometimes, is it the same planet? And yet it's the bottom of the supply chain of EV. So is it, why is it okay to clear cut their trees and pollute their water and destroy their environment in order to preserve ours? That doesn't make sense. That's a hypocrisy. And when you layer on top of that, the human rights offenses, then it becomes even more of a hypocrisy. So, you know, go for it. I, I'm not here to, to tell people what's the right climate policy that, that should be uh, undertaken. But what I am here to say is if you're going to mandate no more ICE vehicles and only EVs right around the corner, you have to sit down and do the work of making sure you're not destroying people and, and their environment of the entire central region of Africa. Yeah, that seems like something that people actually can do is put pressure on if you're someone who's voting for these policies or the politicians who are pushing these policies, you should be actively pushing them to address this at the bottom of the supply chain, because otherwise you that's the hard thing about confronting this is that it's easier to just be ignorant of it. Once you confront it, I it sits with me all the time. It it informs, well, I need a new computer. Should I get a new computer or should I try and make this one? This one's acting up. Should I do what I can to try and optimize this? Well, yes, now that decision, it informs decisions like that because I I. I know that every one of these things that I purchase is coming at a cost and I there's not much I can do about that and having these politicians that that seeing your your interview and reading your book that was the thing that struck me the most was what is going going to be the cost of converting How, is there even enough cobalt and increasing that kind of demand like you say this all starts with demand it's going to decimate these people it has decimated. Them. It has, but won't it just continue to how Absolutely. will it just spread out? I mean, how do we, we are, even the, the legacy of this period, if it continues on this track, the legacy of this period is we're going to look back and realize that we obliterated a people and their world for ours. And then there's no other way to look at it. And that there's going to be a reckoning at some point for the global north. Um, and I hope it's sooner than later so we can at least repair and get on the right track. Because you made a good point. All these policies that are being enacted, and they all come with subsidies. Okay, let's incentivize people. Buy an EV and you get a tax break and so on. How about we allocate a little bit of money to the bottom of the chain while we're at it. Right. And we get back to that thing of just paying people a decent wage, mm -hmm. giving them some PPE, building some schools for the kids, mm -hmm. getting up in the grill of those mining companies and making sure they stop polluting the place, contaminating the place, the little things that can add up and repair this chain going forward. There's no repair for what's been done already. I mean, okay, we could replant a few million trees. Probably wouldn't even cost that much. I don't think seeds are that expensive. But, you know, someone should sit around and do that. But the lives that have been lost, the, 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 the lakes that I've seen that are covered in toxic sludge and foam, the shattered spines, the, the destroyed communities, the mm -hmm. village that have been build, bulldozed. Like there's a damage that's already been done that can never be repaired. Uh, but it has to stop. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has to stop now. And that's the message that I hope conversations like this will help amplify and get out into the world and get in front of policymakers that this has to stop. We can't go back to an era where the people of Africa were valued no more than their replacement cost. Right. Because that's where we are again. Yeah. And that that's what's so painful. How did we go back to that time? Uh, 
on our watch. Yeah. I mean, it makes me wonder, did we ever leave it? Or was it, has it just been ongoing on our watch? And this was something I noticed and I was raging against during the pandemic was this global north versus the south. We were going to South Africa during the time that they were shutting down all the flights because of the South African strain that right. just was labeled that because they had the scientists doing the work. But yes, it was so right. punishing to these countries, you know, these and they were doing everything fine. But it was all of these Western countries getting together and the countries who were suffering the most were all of these countries who rely on the West to come visit and tourism. And they were just decimated. It was painful to see the difference between, you know, they didn't have their governments giving them money so they could stay at home. So it was not fair at all. The, the way that it felt the, the, kind of Western countries were get, getting together, making sure they were okay, but it was at the expense of all of these other much poorer countries. You're, you're right. I mean, it's, in some ways, nothing's changed. And that's one of the points I make in Cobalt Red that, you know, so much time has passed since the colonial era, the slave trading era, and yet how little has actually changed. You know, the 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 package of slavery is just a little more refined now. There's more layers right. between the slaver and the slave. It's all, and it's of course all adorned with these proclamations right. of the sanctity of human rights. So, in a way, we're actually worse because back then there was no there was no charade that we're, we're treating right. Africans okay. There was no charade that they were equal. There was actually a lot of time and energy spent demonstrating that they weren't equal. Now we live in a, in a period where, oh, everyone's equal. And, and yet we're still treating them the same way. So in a way, aren't we the bigger hypocrites? And aren't we the worse offenders uh, than our forefathers and foremothers and, uh, from, from centuries ago? I don't know. Maybe we are. There's something, too, that I learned when I was in South Africa in this instance was some of the barriers, I'm, I imagine it was insanely dangerous for you to go do this research. Even when we were there with the, the NGO, it was a little sketchy there because it's generally these gangs and these huge cartels that are, you know, the rhino trade is black market. This is even weirdly worse because it's not even black market. But there are these barriers for you know well-meaning people who want to get on the ground and try and help and observe because often th the people are being exploited by their own people it's you know the Cong congo is a dangerous place yeah you know and, and parts of south africa are very dangerous too like you said there's cartels and militias and and it's a black market where, where you are congo has been racked by war and strife and invasion and militias i mean for generations and, you know, the mining provinces, if if your audience looks at a map, you, you look at the southeastern little corner of the Congo. Congo is the entire heart it's of huge. the continent. It's yeah. huge. Okay, Africa it's, it's, is huge. It's huge. People yeah. don't realize. People I mean, don't. You fly, uh, you fly across the African continent from, you know, top to bottom. It takes a spell. Yeah, oh, it, yeah. It, when we it, went from even France to South Africa, it's 12 hours. Yeah, it's it's like crossing the Pacific. Yeah, it's it's a you know, it's it's a long. So Congo is the entire heart of the continent. It's an enormous uh, territory. Um, and the mining provinces and the mining provinces are responsible for probably 70 to 80 percent of the national income. It's just the, it's just this tiny little bit in the southeastern corner, uh, a rectangle of, of roughly 400 kilometers by 100 kilometers. Uh, and that's where m more cobalt is sitting in the dirt than the rest of the planet combined. So it's all down. In, and so that part of the country, because there's so much money at stake, you can imagine it's, it's heavily militarized. Mm-hmm. There's army, there's mining police, there's militias, right. 
commandos, guys with Kalashnikovs, they're all roving around because, you know, everywhere you scrape your hand, there's something worth something. Right. And, and so there's a swarm, especially now, you know, with the cobalt scramble, there's a swarm to get in there. And uh, it's it's a complete war zone uh, down there. So getting around is, is not easy. Getting into mining areas is not easy. They're heavily surveilled and guarded. Um, certainly going off the beaten track into some of the more remote areas is even more challenging because they're often under control of uh, militias. I often had to sort of uh, cancel uh, a, a, a specific venture on a day because of militia movements or, you know, turn around and get out at the drop of uh, the drop of a dime. Um, I, I had just one thing, which is I, I always kept my passport in a Velcro strap around my leg. Yeah. And then everything else was just whatever. Like if, yeah. if we had to go, we had to go, but I wasn't going to get stuck somewhere without my passport because yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't be here talking to you. you yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't. You get stuck there. So, and oftentimes we'd have to just burst out on a go uh, uh, very quickly uh, to evade, you know, some kind of peril. Um, but people live there under that menace, uh, and that's another whole uh, part of this. Is this this cobalt scramble has led to so much insecurity and violence in communities that were relatively safe uh, for, for generations. And now there's, you know, there's guys with guns at every corner. There are people just, there are flare, flare ups of one militia on another and people get caught in the, in the fire crossfire. I mean, I have a couple of videos. I, I, I don't, I don't show them. I've never showed them, but um, uh, of kids who were just gunned down, you know, it, outside of a mine um and, and there's just this terror in the community and, right. and this 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 shrieking of grief because everything that's happening uh even kids getting gunned down uh it's all a consequence of this crazy scramble because there's such a fever to get cobalt out of the ground and up the chain because the demand is so far ahead of supply and that has all these consequences that nobody, you know, when they talk about EV mandates, well, who's on the ground making sure kids don't get shot or buried alive or babies aren't being poisoned every day? You know, what? where are the considerations of those collateral consequences to these mandates? Doesn't seem like there's many. And, and I'm, that's where it's always confusing is how how you, one of the things I've noticed with even like the rhino wars, you have to start in the community too, almost because it's easy for people. Maybe they're not the guy who's going to poach the rhino, but they might be the ranger who looks the other way to, for some money. So there has to be some kind of education. And, and in, in that instance, it was getting into the community and seeing how you could help just everyone in the community so that they weren't, tempted to to do this and there again even within these layers of the supply chain what you're describing is layers that are in the communities and locally that are very hard for i mean i don't even know how you get outside of that those incentives locally and with the militias and that's a whole systemic problem that exists in the country well, it's about security, you know, yeah. uh, and, and these communities are living under such a menace of threat and violence. Um, what do the uh, militias do exactly? What is their place in this system? So there's a few things I encountered. Um, you, you know, there, there's so there's the big mines, of course, and they're pretty heavily guarded. Uh, they let artisanal miners in. That means just people who live around there. That term is ridiculous because it makes you think like they're baking bread or something. <laughs> okay. But they're called artisanal miners. They, they right. are people who it is with, a ridiculous, it's a ridiculous. Term. Yeah. You think of like a craft beer. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so they let them in because again, they'll dig a sack, 40 kilogram sack for a dollar and that boosts production. Um, but they, they're secured to keep 
militias out. Um, so what are the militias doing there? So they're in other parts of the mining provinces. It's not that the cobalt is only under the ground where the mines are. It's under the ground everywhere. Right. So they may go into a little territory of a village or two and start compelling people under the threat of violence to dig. Mm. And then what they dig is loaded into a sack. Uh, and then they'll be the ones to then sell it up into the formal supply chain. Wow. So and, there and is so black market cobalt. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, a substantial amount. Right. Um, uh, uh, so that's and then so then that funds their operation. Militia. Yeah. Their militia. <laughs> right. And with cobalt, you can get a lot of money for cobalt. Right. O OK. So, so do you know what the value is for like just black market cobalt? So um, if if a uh, kid or a, a, a person, artisanal miner, you know, spends a day or a family spends a day, they'll they'll get together a sack of about 30 to 40 kilograms of um, ore that has cobalt in it. Uh, and I say ore because cobalt never is on its own in nature. It's it's, it's in a stone that's got other stuff in it, usually yeah. copper, copper and nickel which, by the way, are also very useful for batteries. Right. So they get a sack full of this sto stone and they sell it for a couple of dollars. That's their income, okay, for the day. They'll sell it to an intermediary. Could be a trader, could be a militia person, could be uh, most of the buyers are these sort of Chinese guys that are running around buying up all this child labor, artisanal cobalt, and so on. Um, they will sell that sack to into the formal supply chain. That means to an industrial mining company. And the prices really vary depending on the grade and where you are, but usually they'll sell that sack for 20 bucks, 30 bucks. Mm -hmm. So they're already making, you know, $18, right? $20, $25 on which a is sack. A lot. Which is a lot. Yeah. And, and when you multiply that by several sacks, you know, in many sacks. So uh, they're, they're siphoning a lot of value out of the supply chain that's not going to the bottom. Now, from that point forward, the industrial mining company, it's a little opaque, but ultimately, because they're often vertically integrated, the same mining company will then uh, refine it in China and then make the battery and so on. But there's a spot price for refined cobalt on the London Metal Exchange. Mm. And, you know, that fluctuates. It's usually priced in the ton. Um, uh, but if you if you do the math, like a kilogram of it, a kilogram could be forty, fifty dollars or so of refined wow. cobalt. Um, and I remember that sack of 40, 50 kilograms of raw ore was selling to the artisanal miner for a dollar or two to the mining company for maybe 20 bucks. Now, that's refined. It gets technical, but ultimately you're getting uh, unrefined. Then you're getting refined cobalt for like fifty dollars a, a kilogram. Wow. Okay, so it's it, there's value, right? right? So there's there's a scramble, and what's the consequence of a scramble in a lawless area, in a corrupt area, in an impoverished area? Well, predators. Predators are going to swarm in, and you get ten drug drugged up guys with Kalashnikovs to come into a village and say, "You hundred people, start digging." Or else. What are they going to do? Yeah. What, what are they going to do? And, yeah. and so, so that's that's happening. That flows into the formal supply chain. Uh, so you've got this whole menace. And no, no, you think the companies at the top of the chain are talking about that? Well, we make sure there's no, you know, militias compelling kids to dig. We have people on the ground making sure, you know, they're not. No way. They're not. How do you even? And again, it's dangerous. So I I understand how would you do that, but it's not like we don't have weapons and and ways to to go check and hey, make man, sure people the, are safe the minute the minute we've got one drop of oil supply under threat <laughs> our our i mean what do we deploy right right okay i mean we take over countries yeah uh, when, when we need to this sounds similar actually to what i learned about like the rhino trade is it's not the cart I use the word cartels, but it's the wrong word. It's these Chinese syndicates, and they are the people who facilitate basically these militias or or 
local gangs in South Africa, for instance, are all over Africa. And they are the ones who hire these poachers for very, you know, minimal wages. And then it goes through the gang and then the gang sends it to the syndicate and the syndicate gets it to to China. And I think that the last I heard, um, Rhino Tusk was like the most valuable black market item in the world per ounce or something yeah. like that. It's so crazy. The, and um, they were saying, you know, that. In South Africa, we might the rhinos will probably be gone in five years, and and then everyone will just move on, and yeah. you know, and leave behind a population of poor people who don't have rhinos anymore. Uh, in, in this case, and it's it's interesting, you know, people have said that Africa is China's second continent because when you when you go country to country to country, they're everywhere. Um, at the government level, you know, they're they're building ports and government buildings and rolling out wireless networks. And they do all this in exchange for um, uh, grant money or, or debt, you know, loans to the government. Um, and then on the ground, there's all these black market operatives. Yeah. And, and in South Africa, they're they're appear to be dealing in rhino horns in Congo. They are the they are the intermediaries between uh, the cobalt dug out of the ground by the local population and kids and the formal supply chain. They, they, they're the bridge. Uh, and that's, you know, they're, and many of those companies, mining companies are themselves Chinese owned, uh, but they're on, they're, they're sort of those intermediaries and the brokers and the facilitators uh, at that in the shadow economy. Right. It's so Interesting. That was something that struck me when we were in South Africa, just talking to our drivers and all the Uber drivers or wherever we went. We just talked to everybody. And there's a lot of resentment for a America kind of pulling out of South Africa. I was surprised at how kind of pro Trump some of the South Africans were at that time. We were the, when we were there and um, be towards the Chinese, just the towards China in general, the resentment towards that country kind of taking, they saw it as um, kind of colonizing their country, basically. And that was, I, I knew nothing of this, you know, it was something that I, I learned just from talking to people on the ground. Yeah, put yourself in the shoes of an African for a minute. You know, you, you, you spent three and a half centuries being, carted across the ocean and put in slavery. Then you had a century where Europe colonized the continent. And then no sooner did Europe leave than soon after that, now China's colonizing the place in a different way. It's an economic form of colonization. Uh, so it's just one, one foreign power after another uh, pillaging that continent and and exploiting its people and there's a lot of resentment in congo too about what china and chinese companies are doing i mean people can see with their own eyes in front of them the value in their dirt being yanked out of the ground and and taken off to china with little to no benefit for the local people there yeah I mean, and it should know, be there's so much they it's such a, a resource rich continent it's insane and they don't benefit from it ever it just seems like i i, I can imagine how frustrating that would be you have shanty towns no running water and you you see the value and there's nothing there like where's the trickle down economy here you know that does not exist it's that's the resource curse, yeah, for Africa. I mean, from the minute contact was made with the outside world, uh, and then in the in this case, you know, Europeans who came who came south, and they saw a treasure trove of resources. Uh, I mean, you hang around Western Europe; it's cold, it's dirty, it's unpleasant. I mean, we're talking fourteen hundreds. It's filled with disease and this and that. And so they left, they said, we got to get out and go somewhere. And then they come to Africa and there's gold and diamonds and everything you could imagine. Uh, and then that's it. That That's now five, six centuries of this, of this um, 
viral relationship between Africa and the rest of the planet. I mean, what's a virus do? It goes in, sucks out the value of the host and leaves behind a carcass. Yeah. And and that that's what that's what the north has been doing to Africa for centuries. Yeah. It's so upsetting. I mean, it just the piece I wanted to write that I still I always say this because it's I I say it enough and eventually I'll write it. Um, is how the the problem with the rhino is the problem with everything. Like there, I see in that the when you look at so many of our problems on the globe, there's I can parallel almost any one of these things with this. It's like there's um, local militias, there's poverty at the the in these usually southern hemisphere countries. And um, China's usually somewhere, (laughs) somewhere around, you know, that you mentioned being jaded and some of the guys on the ground in South Africa are who have been fighting in these parks, this war. It is truly a war for, you know, years and years now. And they were caught so off guard. And then in the shadow of the pandemic, nobody was looking. So things got so much worse and they're so jaded. I can't imagine. I mean, even doing what you do, it seems like you see that with your own eyes, the 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 cost, how I can understand how people just get. I don't know. I I don't know what your thoughts are about humanity. Well, first, let me say you have to write your piece. Okay. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Whether it's a blog or a, a I will. An article or a book, you know, you, you have to write it because that that written word endures, you know, and and, you know, look, look what my book has brought you and I together. And we're having this conversation and lots of people who listen to you every week are going to hear this conversation and it's going to continue growing, you know, and you heard me having someone a, a conversation somewhere else. So you know, it starts with word. Okay. Yes. And then, and then, and you're making, I think a very beautiful and important point of this, this metaphor uh, uh, of what you saw in terms of this underbelly of humanity and, mm-hmm. and how the economy and the exploitation works and how these parallels ripple out a- across, across the planet. So that's my charge to you is to okay. write your piece. <laughs> now, humanity. I mean, I've seen horrors that, will haunt me forever. Um, and if if there's such a thing as multiple lifetimes, they're going to haunt me into those as well. It's that deep, that severe, and that painful. Uh, but I have unrelenting faith in humanity for the following reason. The people I've seen and met and listened to who have suffered horrors that you and I can't even begin to comprehend. Yeah. They persevere nonetheless Hmm. with so much grit and grace and fortitude that if they can endure the most ugly, horrific facets of human nature and still stand tall and firm and put one step forward each and every day without resorting to bitterness and resentment and hate. What greater example of the ultimate nobility and strength of humanity could I ever ask to encounter? And that's the inspiration. You know, those people who will have so much more strength than I could ever muster on my best day. So there's no space for me to say, man, this is hard. I'm feeling burnt out. Um, I I can't do it. Uh, It's too much. I've lost faith. Excuse me. Those people are those that's faith. Right. And that's, that's the, they are, it's, it's not the rich people. It's not the, uh, the loudest people who we should aspire to be. It's not the big personalities. It's those people you don't even know, but who have so much more strength 
and nobility and grace because of what they've endured. And they don't let hate take over. They don't let bitterness take over and they don't fold. Mm. Spines are strong and straight and they keep going forward. So that's, that's my inspiration. Even if they're shattered by cobalt mining. (laughs) Even still, even still, you know, their existential backbone Mm. is so strong. Yeah. And that's what, that's what pushes me forward every single day. If they can do it, I have to find a way. I may not be as strong as them, but in my circumstance and with, with what I have to deal with, man, I can, I can certainly find a way to keep persevering. And if, if I do nothing else but help introduce people in our world to people like that so they can hear what they've been through and witness their strength, then that inspiration carries forward. Mm -hmm. And so that's my faith in humanity. I feel fundamentally we are stronger and better uh, than what news and pop culture would have us believe. You know, we're constantly thrust with these images of of divide and anger and violence and hate and, and tribalism and all of this. But I think beneath it all, what's lost is we're all essentially, most of us, good people who want to just lead good lives, be good, good spouses, good parents, good siblings. Uh, and, and there's another side of, there is an, there's an entire class of people out there who have so much to teach us if we take a moment to listen. Mm-hmm. Wow. I mean, we'll have to have you back. I would love to talk more about what what is your next project or what you know what's the response to this Ben how how are you feeling well I uh the book uh which has been out for six or seven weeks now has um uh, had a very uh wide uh response I mean I uh, the number of you know messages I get from people around the world who said I had no idea I, this, this is completely shocking to me. And for me, that means the voices of the Congolese people are being heard. This truth is, is permeating the world. And I know that that's going to lead to good things. So what's next for me is to keep pushing the message. Um, and I'll, I'll know when it's time, uh, to start engaging on the policy side of things. I don't think it's there yet. Um, I don't think we're at maximum, a critical mass of consciousness on this yet, but every conversation like ours is getting us closer. And, 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 and that'll be my next thing, which is I'm not, I'm not taking the story and turning my back on, on the people I met there. I gave every one of them a promise. Number one, your voice will be heard. And number two, I will come back and keep working at this until there's some justice done. Well, I ask the same two questions at the end of all of my podcasts. What is your biggest defect of character? My lack of patience. Uh, It is my my biggest challenge. Um, I struggle with it. In every aspect of life, I struggle to be patient. Uh, And you'd think by this age and, you know, there'd be some temperance and wisdom and, uh, but I, I just, you know, you know, driving around L.A. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's as simple as that sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Just like, all right. You know, I lose it. I lose it in this town sometimes. <laughs> uh, uh, so that and then across every aspect of my life, I just I struggle to stay patient. And what's your biggest asset? I hope it's my compassion. Uh I think that's what it is. Um, I just, I can't look the other way. Yeah, I when understand. Some, when someone's crying out, I, I walk towards that always. And I feel it. I make myself feel it. Mm-hmm. You know, I write in towards the end of my book, uh, an encounter with a, a mother who lost a child in a tunnel collapse. And after the conversation, she went and sat you know, just quietly in the dirt. I could, I knew every thought that was going through her mind and I stopped and made myself feel it. And I knew she was thinking because she had just recounted the story to me. 
what was the final moment of my child's yeah. life? Yeah. Did did he cry to me? Yeah. Was he in terror in that crush of dirt and stone and darkness? Mm. What was the final panic, horrified moment of his life like? And I know that tortured her. I could see it. Her hair had fallen out because she was in so much pain. And she was sitting there with her hands folded quietly with her eyes. And I knew she was thinking it. And I stopped and I made myself imagine it. Because that's the only way I could do some truth and justice to what her story was. Yeah. Was to not just take the words and write them, but to try and feel it and imagine it. If that had been my child. Yeah. Man, I, I think I would have just stopped living. Yeah. Yep. And I think putting ourselves into other people's shoes and trying to really feel their life in a compassionate way is, is such an important thing to do because it's so easy to look at our differences and start hating each other and accusing each other. And the world suffers from such a deficiency of compassion. I always try to prioritize that. And I hope, I hope that's my, my strength. Yeah. I think too, there are these universal things that unite us, like the grief of losing a child, you know, that cuts across every culture, every tribe, every, that's something that no matter who you are, you're in, it's something that unites us and focusing, focusing on those things like you did taking that, letting that land and feeling that it's, it's I want to just push it away you know i want to be like "Mm." naturally i mean yeah who would want to take a moment and actually immerse in that yeah no one yeah but but she deserved it yeah for what she had suffered because she was what she represented was all the mothers there and uh, the least I could do was take a moment and 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 try try to inhabit her grief, her enormous, immeasurable grief of what it must have been like, and what it must be like every night when she closes her eyes in that stillness, in that darkness, when the voice of her her son comes shrieking, and then she imagines, man, yeah. I, the, she brought that child into the world, yeah. And that's how he went out. Yep. Uh, and that's what we're doing to those people. I know and, that's, and that, that, that's, that's, that's what, like the guilt that I, f- you know, I, I feel the compassion, but also with that comes just an enormous sense of responsibility and guilt because I, I didn't directly do that. But like you said in the beginning, nobody would make this choice. But once we are aware of this, Now I'm aware of this, so I am making a choice to participate in this, unless I completely check out. No, you've done your part. You know, right now, with this conversation, you've amplified this story. You've amplified her story and her grief to the world. And that's all we can do. People like you and I. It feels like we should be able to do more. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> For right now, today, this is enough. That's that's true. This is enormous. Yeah. Th- th- this has great value and it will lead to things that will have even more impact down the road. You ha- we have to see the whole arc of what's in front of us and each block that it takes to construct that bridge to justice. Right. And this is one of those blocks. Uh, well, where can we find you and, and you know, keep up with what you're doing and your book? Well, my book, yeah, you can buy it on, you know, any online books, bookseller or ideally a local bookstore. Cobalt Bookshop. Red. Bookshop. Bookshop.org. Yeah, will bookshop. get you the local. It's like where you can get the local. Perfect. Uh, so let's do that. Bookshop.org to find the book locally. Um, 
I'm not super active on social media, but I'm on uh, Twitter and Instagram and I post, I've posted a lot of photos from the field, a little short videos for people to see what does it look like? Yeah. They're uh, devastating, you know, over there. Um, uh, so that's, yeah, that's the way to keep up uh, one, one, one little day at a time. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate all the work you're doing out there in the world and appreciate this conversation more than you know. Uh, I do too. I'm very grateful for the invitation and grateful for the conversation. And I will uh, look forward to uh, continuing the conversation uh, in the months and years to come. Yes. And I will write that piece. Yes, you must. You must. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to look for some sort of message. I'll let that you know. Says, it has been written, said It has Harith. been written. It has Thank been written. Thank you for pushing me. Yes, excellent. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Okay. Okay. So. Yes. Three weeks out. Two and a half. Not even three, I know. It's the, yeah. fi- it's the final countdown. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. That also yeah. reminds me of Arrested Development, my favorite show. I know. For sure. <laughs> For sure. Every time. No, today I was looking at all the stuff I have to edit in between now and then, and I was like, oh, shit. And I was like, okay, I really need to buckle down here because we, we have to get ahead. Yeah. So, you know, I've got two, we've got two historical dumpster fires in the can, like four factory settings, all the walk-ins, welcomes. And like, you have eat. to pack. And I have to pack. So... Got a little freaked out. Yeah. Now, now, now that my back is better too, I can finally move. Next right action. Mm-hmm. That's how I've been taking it. It's like and next and next and next and next. I'm like uh-huh. Pac Man. That's how. Uh-huh. That's the mental image I have for myself. <laughs> Miss Pac Man. Oh, for every anyone who doesn't know, which is probably most people, Bridget is amazing at Miss Pac Man. <laughs> I it's going to be the first thing I get when we have a little bit of extra money. One of those sit down tables like at Nicholas Pizza or one of the big ones. I don't know. Does it matter? I like the stand up ones. I feel like I'm better on the stand up ones for some reason. OK, well, I mean, it's I would just watch her play and you you developed your skills early in early days, didn't you? Was it your first time in L.A.? You did that when mm-hmm. you got really good at it because I would always be like, oh, my God. Oh my, and she'd just be sitting there like calmly moving the little thing up and like I'm always jamming on it and being like, go left, go right. And no, you would just be a like soft doo, touch. Doo, doo, doo. <laughs> I should have gone into the Air Force and been like a drone operator. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the Air Force? I don't even know. I, I don't even know if that's the Air Force that does that. Actually, probably more than one branch of the military has their own drones, wouldn't you think? Yeah. I mean, knowing America, they all have drones. Yep. Everybody has drones. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get back into the dumpster fire musical. I know. I was looking at, I was on Twitter last night and somebody has a podcast now called The Great Awakening. And I was like, Ugh. oh, mother. But it's like a religious, it's like a religious oh. perspective of breaking down like wokeism. It was weird. Okay. Well, we still need to write our musical. And then ruin that podcast. Uh-huh. <laughs> They'll be like, this is sacrilege. Yeah, it's definitely been. I feel like uh, I keep t- thinking that I'm like, I'm on the other side. And then I'm like, no, I'm not. I, then I have a list of 12 million more things. But certain big things have been checked off. Right. And now I've got certain more big things that need to get checked off. But the bigger things are are in my rear view mirror at the moment. And then it's just, uh, you know, a lot yeah. of moving parts. Getting two cars out there, getting yeah. packed. I, I feel like I'm still like, because I haven't really started packing because my back was such a mess. And then, but I you still don't have that I, much though. No, I don't have that much and I still have time. So I think I should be fine as long as I get started this weekend but i still haven't done any of the like the health insurance yeah and utilities changing my address all the places you need to change it whatnot so that's still and i can do some of that on the other side Mm -hmm. um i'm gonna do a lot of that on the other side yeah and then it's still like on the other side then it's getting set back up and back up and running without skipping a beat (laughs) 
I literally have a dream every night that I'm bombing at the mothership. Wow. Every night. Wow. And that all the comedians hate me. <laughs> well, maybe you'll just get it out of the way in your dreams. <laughs> My psyche is really insecure. Really when it comes trying to, to undermine you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really like you're never getting on stage again. And I'm like, screw you. So yeah, this was a heavy episode. It was. It was. I was kind of like worried about watching it because I was just like, oh, it's going to be really heavy. But it was actually really good. You you both somehow managed to keep it from being just completely dark and depressing because it was focused on kind of like facts, possibilities for how you might be able to affect change or like some some things you can do that like seem achievable for people. Like if Siddharth is saying spread the message right now, that's I think an achievable task for people. My uh, thing is that now I try, I've been failing on Twitter lately because everything is so fucking dumb but I'm like, can I use this technology for something good? Right. N- and not be dunking on Dylan Mulvaney and his <laughs> Nike ad. <laughs> Nike women I s- ad. I swear to God, we are being trolled. Yeah. By like corporate America at large. I hate even talking about this. I hate giving it attention. And yeah. by it, I mean Dylan Mulvaney. That's right. I said it. <laughs> <laughs> Canceled. Uh, no, I hate giving any of this attention. I know. I well, hate it. Let's let's skip over it. Because a child in the Congo is digging out cobalt so that I can bitch online about bitch this. About yeah. Some like it, the dis, the it, it hurts my brain. Yeah, it but, hurts my brain that this is how stupid we are at the top of this supply chain. Yeah, and this is what we choose to spend our time doing. But I, but it's actually not stupid because it's, it, 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 I'm telling you, every single one of my group chats is somehow about this. It's like a, every single person I know is like, "What's going on?" Mm-hmm. It's the tip of the spear. Well, bringing awareness to the problem. <laughs> but I definitely, I mean, it was a really eye-opening episode. It was it was heavy material, but I think handled well. And I definitely spent the last 10 minutes weeping when he was telling that story about the mother. I was like, okay. Yeah, no, it was, it was really humbling. Mm-hmm. And he's just such an amazing person. I can't. I know. I can't believe how he chooses to spend his life and his outlook on things and how he, you know, handles it all. Yeah. I can't even imagine knowing what he knows about the supply chains and functioning in our society. Right. Because every supply chain is tainted. (laughs) Clothing. Shrimp. Yeah. It's like, I'll have the shrimp. Do you know what the shrimp people are doing? (laughs) Like so, apparently there like are slaves at there. the bottom of every single supply chain in the world. That's disheartening. Yeah, I feel I I keep hitting walls and then pushing through them, but I really try to keep this kind of thing centered in my heart and mind, and it's so hard. Mm-hmm. But it does make me just hyper aware. I'm I feel like I'm already a person that's hyper aware of this stuff. Mm-hmm. as it is it's just always in my consciousness constantly and I do as much as I can but I never feel like it's enough right well and that's the thing like I don't think you can ever feel like you've done enough you can never be like well I've done enough here but I don't think that should stop you from trying and I think you have to learn to like it seems like Siddharth has done a good job of being like I may never succeed that's okay I can feel good about the life I've lived you know he's just and, like I can't turn away yeah I don't know I I think I don't even know how you get those images out of your head and other than to know that what they're actually experiencing is worse than what you witnessed. And to just right. like he said, bear witness. Right. Right. Oh, 
It makes my problems seem so petty. Yeah, it really does. Leighton Woodhouse, who's going to be a guest on Walkins upcoming soon, who I love and adore. He, he and I were talking about this because he's read Cobalt Red as well. And I told him that I had said Harthon and we were talking about the book and how much it affected us and having kids and having them reach for the screens. And I was like, it's going to be the new, you know, there are starving kids in Africa. Like, you know how many kids had to mine Cobalt for that phone, young uh-huh. lady? Uh-huh. <laughs> It's not it's funny, but it's true. It's true. <sighs> uh, oh, all does right. anything ever change other than our location? <laughs> our location. <laughs> that's one thing that's going to change. Small things. And yeah. And gratitude. Gratitude. An attitude of gratitude. <laughs> People were are still commenting on the factory settings i didn't realize it would trigger so much i knew that would do well i knew that would like go big and then people it's a huge hot button topic for people yeah but i didn't think it was we're still so in it it's Uh always weird to talk about something that i mean we're in all of it it's not like we're recovered we're in recovery but it it just felt very all over the place and scattered you know we because we were just jumping from one thing to the other because it was that's how conversation goes when you're (laughs) just having a right conversation with someone and about something that you're you're you know just here's what comes up yeah it's hard to have perspective on it yeah on your own self we're talking about the most recent episodes of factory settings do i look fat in this (laughs) jaron has the best titles Uh uh-huh he really does he's in charge of titles Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's just gonna be his title at (laughs) fantasy title manager (laughs) title title maker title coiner he's losing today he's like no 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 and i thought someone got in an accident or something and it was Uh some article about how now D and D isn't allowing the characters to be by what is it? They're like, I see, I'm such a not nerd. I don't even know what it is. Hold on. I'm going to find it. (laughs) It was so funny. It was like, what is is everything okay he's like it's like my no D D is formally eliminating half elves and half orcs because it's inherently racist oh god no it's not why isn't it racist to exclude the yeah. mixed breed it's worse somehow but jaron was like this is unprecedented <laughs> <laughs> Dungeons uh, Dungeons and Dragons to remove half species from player's handbook claims the entire idea is inherently racist. <laughs> and Jared was just like so infuriated. I really thought like a loved one got in a car accident. Oh my That's God. how he was like the, the reaction that he had to the to reading that headline. Well, that's that's pretty amazing. <laughs> He's such a nerd. I love him so much. <laughs> He really does need to find a group to play Dungeons and Dragons with when we move. Yeah. Because it comes up every episode of Factory Settings. It was obviously very, very formative for him. Yeah. We need to make that happen. Well, we're not ending on... uh, Oh, we could end on the apocalypse. I'll tease our another guest that I interviewed, Mike Jones. Ooh. From Grand Thumb, our favorite YouTube channel. (laughs) I'm excited to listen to that one. Not my favorite is when he's like, D- "Just come out. We'll get you up to speed. We'll get you to. We'll get you to the skills that every six year old had in 1830." <laughs> that I can handle that. Let's go do that and, and watch we us like, struggle We've lost with it so much. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. He's like, "We'll get you up to the av- the skills an average six year old in 1830 had." Does that include farming? <laughs> I'm like, well, they were dead by eight. Uh, <laughs> so, so it didn't help yeah. them survive very much. Yeah. But speaking of the apocalypse, that's the guy's video. That, that's whose videos you should be watching. To prep. Good luck. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems.
I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>